Okay, everybody, welcome back. Hope everyone had a good weekend. All right. Um, well, let us continue. Uh, we ended up on uh, chapter four, slide 23. I will get that completed and then we're going to jump into uh, chapter five after that. Okay. So, unless there's any questions. Oh, which, by the way, which, by the way, I did move the uh, due date for the activity for this chapter. Of course, obviously, we didn't finish it, so we'll finish it today. So I did make make that activity due for tomorrow. Um, so anyway, we were talking about isotopes. Now, what isotopes are is simply, and you know, we talked about uh, the elements itself. The elements are composed of three subatomic particles. The, the protons with a positive charge, the neutrons with a, a zero charge, and the electrons with a negative charge. Okay. Um, now, the, the proton defines what an element is. The moment we change the element, the excuse me, the moment we change the number of protons an element has, we now have uh, created or have a, a different element. Okay. Electrons are gained and, and lost all day long. It has no effect as to whether you uh, uh, change a pro uh, change the element of what type it is. All you do is by gaining and losing electrons, you create what are called ions. They're a charged species of these elements. The elements are neutral, remember, because the elements have an equal number of protons and an equal number of electrons, which have an net zero. Now, it is the neutrons that constitute what we have, what are called isotopes. And by having uh, a different number of um, neutrons, it creates a, an isotope. Now, for example, here we, we have carbon. There's, at this one here shows three types of carbon. Everybody here has the same number of protons, carbon 12. And the way it's written is, is, is the name hyphen and then the, the the number following the name so carbon 12 carbon 13 carbon 14 and there is also carbon 11 us all of them have six protons okay where they differ is a number of neutrons so basically uh, relative to carbon 12 there's going to be one less neutron or one or two more neutrons relative to carbon 12. And so carbon 12 has six neutrons, carbon 13 has seven neutrons, and carbon 14 has eight neutrons. And if we had carbon 11 here, carbon 11 would have uh, five neutrons, okay? We ended up, <coughs> excuse me, we ended up at this particular table to kind of demonstrate the whole thing. Here we're, we're looking at uh, the isotope, uh, specifically carbon, excuse me, oxygen, oxygen hyphen 16, 17, and 18, okay? Now, with respect to the mass number, the mass number is given to you. It's that number after the name. So hyphen 16, hyphen 17, hyphen 18, that is the mass number. Remember, the mass number is always a whole number. Not to be confused with the atomic weight, which is a decimal number. We're more on that here in a bit. Now, the number of protons being oxygen, they're all going to be the same with respect to the number of protons and with respect to the number of electrons. Okay. So the mass number here, basically what is given from the name. Okay. The number of protons, all of them are going to be the same. Otherwise, if they're not the same, it's a different element. And being neutral species, we're talking about the elements. They, all of them have eight electrons, okay? Where they differ is the number of neutrons. And so simply taking the mass number minus the number of protons or the number of electrons equals eight. 16 minus 8 equals 8, 17 minus 8 equals 9, and 18 minus 8 equals 10, okay? 
so different. The isotopes simply are uh, the number of, of uh, neutrons for that particular atom. Now, the most common isotope, now, to refresh me, the most common isotope that we can determine is by going to the periodic table. And simply, simply looking at the element of what we want to look at, and uh, let me close this up, and just take the atomic weight given in from the product table, for example, calcium, its atomic weight is 40.08. And we round that up to the most common uh, to the to the rounded up to the nearest whole number. Okay. So we're talking about calcium here. And the most common isotope, then we can write by saying calcium hyphen 40. We take the atomic weight, which that decimal number below the symbol, rounded up to the nearest whole number. So calcium 40 would be the most common isotope. Okay. Sodium would be sodium hyphen 23. We take that 22.90, round it up to the nearest whole number. Okay, so on and so forth. So you should be able to do that for any of the elements that you give in here, simply by rounding it up to the nearest whole number. The only place we really can't do that is if we look at these elements aren't starting down here that have their atomic weight in, in parentheses. The reason they're in parentheses is that all these species are uh, radioactive and break down, decompose very rapidly, and hence we really cannot get a good uh, measurement with respect to the atomic weight for those. But everything, every, all the other ones we can do. So for platinum right here, that would be platinum 195. Okay. So the gold, excuse me, gold, it would be gold 197, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Let's clear this up, go back. And the reason we say uh, we can do that is because normally if we were to uh, take these numbers, 16, 17, and 18, and if we were to average those up, you know, our average would be 17, right? If we average 16, 17, and 18, we add, uh, add those all three numbers up divided by three, guess what? Our average would be 17. Well, then that would be that would be correct. However, there's a different we gotta get do what's called a weighted average, okay? Because there's more of oxygen 16 than there is of 17 than, than there is of 18. And so oxygen, for example, could be about 98%. I don't know, somewhere in that ballpark, 1% for oxygen 17, maybe another 1% for 18. And so now we take 98% of 16, 1% of 17, 1% of uh, 18, and we get a number that would be closer to 16, okay? So that is the most common isotope for oxygen, oxygen 16, because it is the most abundant isotope. And that's what this is, what I'm trying to explain here. And there's another example with respect to carbon, okay? Carbon, we, we got carbon 11, carbon 12, carbon 13, carbon 14. Then we have the approximate, the approximate uh, percentage of each. Uh, there is uh, some percentage, though for 11 and 14, they say minor amounts, but there is a small percentage that we can plug in there and, and calculate. Carbon-12, the most common isotope, okay? And so we need to do a weighted average for these numbers, 11, 12, 13, and 14. And when we do that, the average, which will be the weighted average, will be equal to 12.01 for carbon, okay? And that's why you see that number, 12.01, below given for the atomic weight for carbon. And you see carbon, and then 12.01 in the bottom. 
Point being about this is that the atomic weights that we utilize that we're going to be using for calculations down the road, we don't, uh, they don't determine our significant digits. Why? Because the atomic weights of all the elements are based, are the, are the weighted average of whole numbers. Like in this example, 11, 12, 13, and 14. That being the case, they had what? but it's considered to have an infinite number of secrets. So we don't utilize that. Uh, second point is that uh, <clears throat> depending on where you read and so forth, you, you could get a variety of uh, different uh, atomic weights with more numbers, 12.01 and plus other numbers. And uh, remember this, that when we do calculations using atomic weights, you please use the atomic weights given in our periodic, periodic table, because those are the numbers that we utilize for any of the questions that are in Canvas, okay? And, and if you use a different atomic weight, you may get a different number, slightly different number. And Canvas, uh, even though it could be off by one number or a hundredth of a number, it would treat it as incorrect. But nevertheless, if uh, that number is incorrect, and let's say you calculate 12.5, you use 12.02 in your calculations that can propagate air. And if you know your number's correct, do shoot me an email and I will definitely give you credit. But without having to go through that, just use our periodic tables. Okay. And that is an overview of what I just talked about with respect to isotopes and the atomic weight of our elements. Now, for that being the case, we can go to uh, the periodic table and we could be given a problem like the follows, lithium-6 versus lithium-7. And the question would be, which is the most abundant isotope? Well, all we got to do is go to the periodic table, okay? Look for lithium, which is number three here. Its atomic uh, weight here is given as 6.94, right here. Okay, round that up to the nearest uh, whole number, and that is seven. And so we have lithium seven is the most abundant isotope. We didn't have to memorize anything. We just need to just find it on the periodic table, look at it, find it. So it's uh, atomic weight and round it up to the nearest home. Okay, so lithium seven is the most abundant isotope of all the lithium isotopes. Okay, next one is chlorine. Okay, so question is uh, between chlorine thirty five and chlorine thirty seven, which is the most abundant isotope. Uh, so again, we go to the periodic table, look for chlorine, which yeah, it's on the far right. It's in group number seven, and here's chlorine right here. Okay, number seventeen. It its atomic uh, atomic uh, weight is thirty five point four five. So now we have chlorine thirty five. Okay, I didn't write out the whole name; I just put the symbol. You see it sometimes. Either write out the whole name, hyphen, then the uh, mass number or uh, give the symbol. So chlorine 35 is the most abundant isotope of the chlorines. Okay. So questions like this could occur for, you know, at least up to the 92 uh, element because those anything above that, they're all radioactive and we don't have a, a specific atomic weight for them. Okay. And uh, so, this is, and that's what, what uh, this, this slide's all about, okay? They're very unstable, the ones with the atomic weight in parentheses because they break down and radioactive, as I stated, very unstable, and uh, give off a lot of bad uh, electromagnetic radiation, okay? Number, uh, element number 96, for example, is curium which is named after Madame Curie, very famous woman scientist. 
had two PhDs. She originally came from Poland. A lot of people mistake her because she has the name Curie as being French. The reason she came at um, the Poly uh, in French name is because her husband, who also shared a Nobel Prize with her, uh, was a friend. And like I said, she was from um, um, Poland, came to France. France at the time period was the mecca of scientific knowledge at the time, I guess, and research. Furthermore, at her during her time period, women were not allowed to advance their education and go on and get her doctorate. So she went on to get her doctorate from France. Her kids also got uh, Nobel, Nobel Prizes. Anyways, something to get one Nobel Prize, she got two of them. All right, so which brings us to a couple of things about chemical formulas. Here, we are not gonna go specifically about the structure and so forth. We, all we're doing here is to uh, make you aware of the elements in a formula they're written out and determine how many of each uh, atoms are presented in the formula. Okay, give us a gave a, to give us a total number. Uh, the way they're written, ninety nine percent of the time, it it can follow how things are bonded. But there are times that no, it doesn't. We will always, for example, tell you uh, when we write a formula, I'll uh, present a formula, it will tell you which element is the central atom. We're always going to have a central atom, and then whatever elements are around it in, in the formula that's written are bonded to the central element. Okay. Now the number of atoms are indicated by the number uh, by the subscript after the symbol. Okay, if it's just one element, we leave it blank. We don't put a subscript blank. Okay, for example, the uh, the formula H two O. What that tells us is there are a total of three atoms. Um, specifically, there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. Okay. Now, like I said, about 99% of the time, the element that is written first generally is the central atom, and then whatever follows is bonded to the central atom. There are some exceptions. For example, H2O. Obviously, the hydrogens are written first, and that would infer that the hydrogens are the central atom, but they're not. Uh, uh, it just, it's just an exception to the comment about what I said earlier, just by convention. People write H2O is the formula for uh, uh, water, and oxygen is the central atom, and then bonded to the central atom are the two hydrogens in this manner. We're going to learn about this bonding. Re this single line here represents a, a bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen, more specifically, a specific type of bond. So if we look at this formula um, given C3H6O3, nothing is said about the structure. At this point in time, we're not really concerned about that. Uh, but all we, what we take away is this, is that there are three carbon atoms, there are six hydrogen atoms, and there are three oxygen atoms in this general formula for a compound. Okay, And it gives us a total of 12 atoms for this general formula. Okay. And this, the way it's written like this, this could be any multiple compounds, but in, in generally this one, if, if you like Italian dressing, this is what you're eating. You're eating a com chemical compound with three carbons, six hydrogens, and three oxygens. Uh, it is called uh, acetic acid, AKA vinegar. Okay. All right. But it's 12. Now, sometimes we write formulas with parentheses. This is very, very important. The important part here is, is that the fact is when you see parentheses, what that tells you is that within the parentheses is what we call a unit. Okay. Now, let me share with you the periodic table real quick. Okay. On the periodic table, on the bottom left, we have a, another table 
called most common polyatomic ions, okay? Now, these, what the, the takeaway here is that these are, uh, think of it as uh, units, okay? These are units that stay together. These units have, are called polyatomic ions. We have much more on this. Notice that these units have charges in them, okay? If you look at the one we're, we're working with right now, you'll see NH4. In other words, there's nitrogen with four hydrogens around it, and it has a plus charge. Most of them are, have a negative charge. Look at this one here, okay, acetate. Now, hydroxide, cyanide. Be familiar with these units. We're going to use these quite a bit, okay? And when we need more than one of these units, we use a parentheses to demonstrate that we need more than one. And that is why you see here, and here's that NH4. You see that NH4? It's called the ammonium polyatomic ion. But there's a parentheses, and then there's two, which tells you though you're you need you're using two of those NH4 units, followed by a carbon and three uh, oxygen. Okay, the breakdown is this: there's two of these units, so that means you got two nitrogens and eight hydrogens. Okay, two nitrogens and eight hydrogens. Plus you have right, two nitrogens, eight hydrogens, plus you have one carbon and, a, and then the total of three oxygens for a grand total of 14 atoms, okay? Now, down the road, once we have, we learn how to identify how many of each atoms we have, we can now take the atomic weight of each element involved in the, in the uh, formula, multiply that two by the formula weight of nitrogen, that eight by the formula weight of hydrogen, okay, the one by the formula weight of carbon, and then three by the formula weight of oxygen, tally all that up, and that gives us what we call the formula weight of that molecule. Furthermore, we can now take the percentage and determine how much percentage of nitrogen is made up in this formula by taking the total contribution of nitrogens, divide that by the whole, which is the total formula weight of the molecule times 100. And we end up with a percentage. More on that. In a bit. So right now, just identify how many atoms and how many total atoms you have in that molecule, okay? For example, here we have H3PO4. We're not concerned at this point as to what it is, okay, and how to name it or anything, but you will see this formula again, H3PO4. And if you like to drink a lot of soda pop, like I do, you probably drink a lot of this. This is called phosphoric acid, a lot of phosphoric acid in, in, uh, in, um, in a soda pop, okay? Then the bottom one, there's, before we continue, here we have three hydrogens, okay? One phosphorus and four oxygen. So we got a total of, change the color here, eight atoms, right? Total of eight atoms, okay? Now the next one, this is calcium. And then you have that parentheses again, okay? That's a unit inside the unit is called the hydroxide. This, by the way, is called calcium hydroxide. And so we have one calcium, okay? And we have two oxygens, okay? And two hydrogens for a grand total of five atoms. Okay, got a, oh, got a question there, hold on. Hey, that is correct. Okay, now how about this last one? How many atoms total? I'll let you guys work on it. How many total atoms do we have in this last one? 17? Yeah, that's correct. Because we have 
of two aluminums. Okay, there's that bracket again. This guy in here is called sulfate, has his own little name. Okay, if you can look it up in the product table, might as well become familiar with the names because down the road we're going to be learning names. This guy, this guy, the first one we did up here, this is the hydroxide. If you look at that polyatomic ion table, you find it listed there as OH, and you'll find it with a negative charge. And then you'll find also the SO4, which is the sulfate. Okay. Anyway, there's three of those sulfates. And so we got uh, three sulfurs, right? And 12 oxygens. And there you go, total 17 atoms. Oh, 17 atoms. And then, like I said, we're going to do a percentage of each one to give us a percent composition. Not, not right. Not a lot now, but th this is what we can do that with with, uh, with oxygen, uh, excuse me, with water. And I'll, go, I'll briefly go through it, but we'll get more detail down the road. For example, water contains one hydrogen, two hydrogens, and one oxygen, right? So that means that we can through, go through the calculations and determine that water is 11.2% hydrogen and 88.8% .8 oxygen, okay? You might ask, well, how do you do that? Well, good thing you asked. You, we know there's two hydrogens, right? Now, each hydrogen is has an atomic weight of 1.01. You can find that on the periodic table for each one. So it's a total of 2.02 contribution of the hydrogen. The oxygens, there's one oxygen, okay, and that is 16, so 16.00. So the total atomic weight for water is 18.02, okay? Now, if you take the 2.02, you divide that by 18.02 times 100, and if you take the 16.00 and divide that by the total, uh, the total of atomic weight of 18.02, guess what? You end up with 11.2% hydrogen and 88.8% oxygen. And that percent, percent, percent composition is, is persistent regardless of where you get the water, whether you get the water here in Arizona or on the moon or wherever planet. If the formula is H2O, then that's the percent composition. We use that uh, a lot in, uh, back when I was synthesizing compounds, we make a new compound. That is one of the things we would do, clean it up, get it as pure as possible. We had an idea what the formula was. We calculate a percent composition. We send that out to the lab. With the analysis, it comes back, and if we anticipate, you know, 30% carbon, X percent hydrogens, oxygen, sulfur, that's consistent with what the formula is that we had predicted with respect to the compound that we made, okay? All right, so that being said, congratulations. We're down four chapters now. All right. Four chapters, 11 to go. All right, any questions before we continue? Now, this particular chapter, okay, we kind of introduce the elements, okay? Kind of introduce formulas and how they're they're coming together. You see, we're gonna we're going to now. We're still dealing with the elements, but we need more more working out of the model of, of what we have because at this point, what we have is a nucleus and the model of we have a nucleus where the proton and the uh, neutron exists, and then the electrons are somewhere surrounding the atom. Okay, we don't have quite the picture yet. So <laughs> along comes again some more research. And um, we now have started, started to develop a more clear.
future model with respect to the electrons. Now, the big takeaway is this. If you look at that periodic table, okay, before I continue, especially the one that I, that I use quite a bit, if you look at this periodic table, Notice on my left, and you, I would recommend doing the same because the periodic table is not marked. But on the left here, I have you see the per starting with hydrogen going across to helium, label that number one, and then the next row, number two, next, and then three, four, five, six, and seven. There are seven rows on the periodic table. Those represent specific energy levels, specific energy levels of where these electrons exist, okay? And that's what we're going to talk about. And if you notice that on my screen in the back, you'll see some pictures that are round for the first one. And then some other next layer has a, a kind of what we call dumbbell shape. These are what we call orbits where electrons exist. Okay, we're going to have much more on that here in a bit. But before I can do that, what I got to do is kind of talk to you about the electron and one of its properties. The thing about the electron is it is so small in mass that we give it a zero atomic mass unit. Okay. But because of its small size, it also has properties like light. Okay, given the fact that it has mass associated with it, but because it's so small, it also has properties of, of, uh, of light. And so talk, talking about the electrons and the energy levels, we're gonna have to kind of talk about uh, properties of light and, and use that to explain how the electrons are uh, existing, okay? So let's talk about the light because the electrons are, you know, they exist, uh, light exists in waves and the electrons have that same property, okay? They have what are called wave properties as they travel from point A to point B. Now here we have a picture of an image of a, a what represents a, the way light travels through space, okay? Now, what we can do, and this is traveling, we have, you know, hills and valleys, hills and valleys as we go, you know, up through here, go up and down, so forth. So, what we can do is, if we take on top of the hill, in this case, they call it the crest or the throat there, but top of the hill, and if we <clears throat> mark the distance on the same spot on the next hill, we have an, a measurement. We have something that we call a wavelength. We give it a symbol called lambda, okay? That represents what is the wavelength. And that is the distance from hill to hill. Now, the point here is this. It doesn't have to be on top of the hill. It could be the bottom of the hill. If you mark that spot and go to the bottom of the next hill, that same distance is the same same lambda, it is the same, same wavelength, okay? So land, lambda wavelength is the distance between peaks from one wave to the next same wave, the adjacent wave, okay? Now, the frequency, which you might be familiar with, you know, or maybe not. When you went and bought your computer, you probably, uh, you know, maybe you didn't pay attention to your processor and you see what speed it's operating. You know, we're up, at, we're up to the gigahertz. You know, you may have heard that term, gigahertz. Maybe you're operating at two gigahertz, three gigahertz. And, uh, you know, if you're a big gamer, you probably want a processor that, uh, that operates as fast as possible. And what that hertz is all about is the gigahertz is like how many things can happen in, uh, within a given time unit, okay? Normally a given second. So when you're at the gigahertz, there's like 1 billion things happening within one second. All right. Now, when I started with computers 100 years ago, 
we were in the megabytes. We were in the megahertz. It was only very small compared to the gigahertz right now. Okay. So we have progressed quite a bit. So that frequency, which we call, we give it a special symbol, looks like a V. So we got lambda here, and this is called mu, Greek simple, lambda and mu. And the frequency is the number of cycles completed in one second, okay? Like if you want to consider it like a beat, how many beats in one second? You can have one beat per second, or you can have, you know, 30 beats per second. You know, you can do the same thing with your heartbeat. You figure out how many beats per minute, convert that to seconds, and that is your frequency, okay? All right. So what we can, what we're doing here is we're taking two specific wavelengths, okay? Uh, and we're comparing them. And the first thing you can see is from hill to hill, uh, it is a very long wavelength, relatively long compared to the bottom one. So if you look at the bottom top image and look at its wavelength, okay, and compare it to the wavelength of the, of the bottom one, notice quite a difference, right? From here to here, at least distance wise. So this is long, change the color here. And this is a short wavelength. You know, we're not talking absolute numbers right now, we're just doing relative. You can see it's longer in distance on top than it is in the bottom. Now, what is associated with long wavelengths is a low. Light has energy, okay? There's a lot of energy. Now, you don't believe me? You know, look at uh, lasers. There are lasers made up of light that cut metal, okay? And then we got lasers that are, you know, pointers and so forth, you know, that are not as strong but can be damaging to the eye. So light is associated with it is, is energy, okay? So when you have a, comparing two different uh, wavelengths, the wavelength with the long wavelength has a low energy, okay? And a low frequency. Now, if we were to just compare a frequency, and it's just for argument's sake, that from point here to point here was one second, okay? So we count one second. You can see that there's like two wavelengths that go through in that one second for the top one, but we got one, two, three, maybe four wavelengths for the bottom one. So more wavelengths went through in that one second than it did in the top one, okay? That means that the frequency is low for the long wavelength and the energy is low for the long wavelength. The converse is true. For the short wavelength, it is associated with high energy and high frequency, okay? The best examples of this is radio waves. I know nobody uses the radio station or live radio, but you know, you turn your radio on and you're picking up your radio station. That has a certain uh, wavelength when you dial it into whatever channel you're listening to, has a very specific wavelength. But their wavelengths are very large, they're in the meter range. They don't have a lot of energy, they're easily blocked by buildings and mountains and so forth. Okay, and they have a low frequency. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, you have x-rays, and we're all familiar with x-rays, so we probably at one point in time have had an x-ray done or know somebody who's had one done, and those x-rays penetrate your body. Okay, that's they have very short wavelengths and very high energy, okay, and very high frequency. And then they can be de deadly. Too much x-ray exposure can be a problem. And they even stronger than those, we have gamma rays. So what we're talking about is the electromagnetic radiation. You know, we all think when we hear that term electromagnetic radiation, we just think of 
like x-rays and stuff like that. But it also encompasses radio waves. It encompasses uh, visible wavelength and so forth. Okay, so it encompasses, and it's all dependent on the wavelength. Let me clear this up. Okay, so the, the points at this point, the main takeaway here is that light has a specific wavelength, okay, a specific energy associated with it, and a specific frequency associated with it. So we could look at a, a diagram and answer the following question. It says, which has a higher energy? Well, you can see that wave B is the shorter wavelength. Okay. So that means that B has the higher energy, whereas A would have the lower energy and the lower frequency. Okay. So here's the electromagnetic radiation scale. It's not drawn, it's not drawn to exact scale, but this gives you an idea of where we're at. If we look on the far right, you can see that that is represents the radio waves. This is your favorite radio station. Okay. Very large, large wavelengths, very low, low energy. And then if we go across the spectrum here, all the way past X-rays, you get into gamma rays, extremely dangerous electromagnetic radiation, extremely dangerous, very short wavelengths, very high energy. Okay? And if you look at what we can see, you know, it's not, it should, this area here should be really drawn into a smaller scale. Because what we can see with our eyes are very small compared to the rest of the, the spectrum that's there. And that's simply because we have, uh, we're limited with the sensors in our eyes. We have two types of cells in our eyes, cones and rods that pick up color and uh, rods pick up uh, grayscale. You ever notice that at nighttime, everything is grayscale until a bright light comes in and then everything backs the color. And um, anyway, um, be familiar with the spectrum. Far left is X-rays. Then we got uh, gamma rays and X-rays and ultraviolet. You know, ultraviolet can be very hazardous. Don't believe me, sit on the sun for a little bit without any protection. And long-term can cause a lot of damage, okay? A lot of damage to your skin, cancers, you know, but so forth. But it affects crops too. And the problem here is that uh, we have up on top in the atmosphere a what we call an ozone layer, not what's down here, causing all kinds of breathing problems, but way up in, in the air, we have a very thin layer of ozone, which protects us from the UV light emitted by the sun. And it has done that for a long time, but we uh, have been destroying some of it. And so the effect has been that uh, over the years, there's more and more ultraviolet light coming down. I mean, if you notice, maybe not, but uh, the protection on your on your skin for sunbathing, that number has gone up over the years, okay? Very high numbers. So UV could be very destructive and very deadly to your skin and to plants, right? Then we have below visible, we got the infrared, okay? And then microwave, you know, not a lot of energy involved in, but still, this is what you use to uh, make your popcorn, okay? Microwaves, and then we got the radio waves. All right. So this is one of the things. Let me back up for a second. When you talk about microwaves, uh, and then this is not to get near the microwave. Um, there's, well, well, we'll talk about that down the road here. <laughs> we'll come back to it. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit about the theory about the electrons. Now, keep in mind, we had back last chapter, we talked about J.J. Thompson and Rutherford, 1900s and all that. So, there's a lot of stuff going on. So here we are back again, 1900s, Max Planck, another famous scientist you may not be familiar with. 
Uh, there is in Europe a, a, a famous institute called the Max Planck Institute with a lot of big time science is coming out of. Okay. What he proposed back in the 1900s, and I guess is the time that Einstein's also living. So we got a lot of uh, top notch science is going on. We, we, we don't mention there's people like Heisenberg. You know, we already mentioned J.J. Thompson and Rutherford and all that, but uh, uh, what's his name? Einstein got the, is more well known. Anyway, Max Planck proposed a very controversial idea at this time period. He proposed that energy was emitted in small bundles, okay, small bundles. It wasn't continuous, but small bundles of, of energy called quanta. That was his proposal. And that energy was not something that was continuously emitted. Okay. Uh, so he proposed that, uh, he defined, I should say, that the in individual energy of light, uh, the unit of the individual energy was uh, called a photon. Hence the term photon torpedoes. I don't know, a little side note there. Yeah. So what he's proposing is that energy is quantized, that they exist in specific energy level. Okay. Remember the periodic table, keep that in the back of your mind, back of your head. Energy levels period one through seven. Okay. And that energy was not continuous, it was quantized and existing in specific energy levels. Unlike the wedge on the left, which would represent continuous energy, what he was proposing is more like the stair steps. And so you have down at the bottom, what we call the ground state. Okay, now matter exists in the ground state, whatever state that is. And that what happens is, and as it gets excited, it kicks it get, kicks up to an excited state of a specific energy level. Note that the steps here represent specific energy levels. Okay, analogous to the periodic table period where you got seven energy levels. This is what he's proposed. What is being proposed? Specific energy levels. All right, so here comes another scientist, same time period. Okay, notice the time, 1913. This guy is Niels Bohr, another famous scientist. He took that idea that Max Planck had and brought it over to the electrons, given their small size and so forth and some other observations. He proposed that electrons orbit around the nucleus, but and at specific energy levels, okay? Reference again, periodic table with seven energy levels, okay? It was back in 19, 1913. And so therefore the electrons themselves being very small, acting like light, then they themselves could be quantized, all right? And so, and we have the or electrons orbiting the nucleus in three dimensional, much like uh, the planets around the sun, but in three dimension. And that uh, these orbits are called energy levels. You also will hear the, see the term shells. I prefer the term energy levels, seven energy levels. Notice that the periodic table, as I stated, it's seven energy levels. And that each energy level has a specific radius and a specific energy amount or quantity, okay? And so we have the model here on, representing on your right, where you've got the nucleus in the center and then the dotted lines. Now bear in mind, it's two dimensional, but keep this in mind, we live in a three dimensional world. And so if you look at the, the pictures behind us, especially the very top one, where you can think of the first energy level being in the shape of a ball. We have, as we progress from first energy level, the ball is a certain size. Second energy level, we're getting another, you know, we start off with maybe a golf ball, move up to the next level to maybe a softball, maybe up to a soccer ball, all the way up to maybe a beach ball, but the same shape, okay, circular, okay? 
at least for that particular of energy level. We're going to have other shapes that we're going to talk about. So that's Bohr's model at this point. Now, how do we know that? How do you prove this? You prove this by what they call line spectrum. Now, what is that exactly? Okay. Now, what he did was, we're all familiar with uh, neon light, right? We got these tubes that are um, filled with a gas, and then they're electrified, and then they emit uh, light of a certain color, okay? And that's basically what he did, okay? He took uh, gases of different elements, put them in a glass tube, and then uh, hit them with electricity and different lights colored lights were emitted, but he took it one step further. What he did was he took that light and ran it through a prism to separate the light, much like uh, we do with uh, what happens on nature when we see a rainbow, the water droplets break up the light into the different wavelengths, so then when it's, hence we see that rainbow of different colors, okay? When in doing that, he created what's called an emission line spectrum, okay? Let me explain a little bit further here. Okay, so he created the tube with, in this case, he put hydrogen in it. Okay, then we put the current through it. Now, keep in mind, we're putting energy into the system. When molecules absorb that energy, they go from what I showed earlier from a ground state, whatever ground state that is, and they get kicked up. We, we now, this is our model, those electrons get kicked up to the next energy level, okay? Now, those molecules, those electrons are not going to exist at that level for a long period of time because nature being nature cannot stay in excited state very long. It drops back down to the ground state. And in doing so, because the conservation of energy law tells us that whatever energy you put into the system, you're going to take out the same amount of energy. And what happens is that electron then emits that energy that it absorbed when it goes back to the ground state, but emits it in the form of light. Okay. And sometimes it's heat. If you have uh, our, uh, our, uh, more examples than that in a second. So in taking that, light, which is again a neon light going on here, it takes the light, run it through, through some slits, and all that did was just focus the light into a prism. And what the prism did was separate the light into the different wavelengths, just like a rainbow. When it rains, you see that rainbow, what you're seeing is that light being separated into the different wavelengths by the uh, water molecules or the light the, the water up in the atmosphere, and you can see that rainbow. We see that rainbow because there's other light there, but our eyes only pick up the visible. Remember that because we only can pick up a certain amount. And when that happens, it emits this spectrum. Notice this different lines. We had violet, blue violet, the blue green, the red light, and it has a specific uh, length. In this case, they're called nanometers and nanometers, 10 to the negative three meters, okay? That is the fingerprint for hydrogen, okay? Hydrogen emits that spectrum. That's how we can identify hydrogen by, and by analyzing the light and running it through a, 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 a analyzer and breaking it up. And we can determine what's out in space by an analysis of the emission of light, a lot more complicated than I just showed you there, but we can use this because we have shown, it's been shown, that for different elements, you, each one has their own very specific emission line spectrum, okay? Totally different, and that's the fingerprint for that particular element, and also for compounds and such, okay? So, each line represents a different energy level. And then go, taking that information and then working backwards, so to speak, it was able to be determined that these electrons exist at very different energy levels, at specific energy levels. Um, what is happening here 
is as follows. I explained here earlier. Here's an element. You put energy into the system, you'll kick it up from here, maybe to the next energy level. So it exists there for a time period, but it can't do that very long. It has to drop back down to its ground state. And when it does that, it emits the energy it absorbed either in the form of light or heat or both. Okay. If you have a, a um, fluorescent ball, any light ball. In fact, that's what's happening to the screen right now. The molecules, the molecules that you're seeing on the screen in front of you, on the screen, are being excited to an excess ground uh, excited state, but they don't hang out there very long. Then drop back down, uh, back to the ground state, and you're able to see the image. You have a, a, another example would be you have a electric uh, um, um, stove. You turn the burner on, right, on the stove, and it heats up the coil. The molecules in there get excited. And the way that that material works, that most of that energy that it picked up is releases heat. That's why the coil gets hot. But there is some light, and that's why the photo gets red. Okay. Right. So this happens very fast. If you were looking at a fluorescent bulb, you know, you look at it, you think it's continuous, but if you're able to slow time down very, very slow, you'll see like a strobe light occurring on that uh, light because it, it's the electrons going from ground, excited back down, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. All right. So what Given all that and, and a lot of mathematics involved beyond the scope of Chem 130, what it was determined is this, is, is that there are, the model that is, there are seven energy levels, okay? Now, within the energy levels, there are what are called sub-levels. I don't use the term, well, I don't, but a lot of people, scientists don't use the term sub-levels. We call them orbits. Okay, there are specifically five different types of orbits that have been proposed. Now, this comes from, let me, let me qualify this a little bit, is this model comes from the mathematics of what we call, what are called quantum mechanics. Okay, um, so it's not this is the model. And what has happened is what we have, what we experiment with seems to fit what the model is hitting so far. Doesn't mean it doesn't change. You know, next week we get a new model, could. You know, or we get more information to help refine the model that we have now. Okay, so we have seven energy levels. Within the energy levels, we have four different types of sublevels, aka orbits. Okay. AKA orbits. And this is where the electrons are uh, existing. Oh, I forgot something. Those sublevels are denoted by the letters S, P, D, and F. Okay? S, P, D, and F. Now, the first energy level is denoted there's only one sublevel for the first energy level and the very first period on the periodic table, which encompasses just hydrogen and helium. Okay. The only sublevel or orbit in the first energy level is an S orbit. Okay. And that is denoted by the number one, which represents the first energy level and the letter S. There's only one orbit, one energy level. The second energy level, which if you look at the periodic table now is the second period, which begins with lithium and goes all the way across to neon. I, I keep making reference to the periodic table because you're gonna see here that we can use the periodic table to do what we call down the road, we're gonna do some electron configurations. Now, on the second energy level, there are two uh, sublevels or orbits. Now, point number one, everybody from one through seven, all of them contain the seven orbit, or the S orbit, I should say, 
Okay. It is only on the second energy level that the P comes into play. And we put a, the, the coefficient there tells you it's the second energy level. So how do we distinguish the first S from the second S? We put a one or a two in front of it. Okay, no problem, Jason. All right. Okay, notice, like I said, we have S, a 1S and a 2S. The two tells us, you know, it's just like having a golf ball on the first energy level, this size. And then when we go to 2S, maybe we've got the softball. The 2S, still the same shape, but it's just bigger and diameter. Okay, but at also the sec at the second energy level, we introduce the new orbit called the P. In the third energy level, Again, keeping, keeping your periodic table along with you, you'll see starting the third period, we also have the S. We also have the P, it just happens to be in the third energy level, but then we introduce the D. It is only at this point that the D comes into play, okay? We're only gonna go to the fourth, and if we introduce the fourth energy level, we, Again, also have S, okay? Everybody has the S all the way to number seven. We're gonna stop at the four here. Then starting the second level, then the P comes into play. So everybody from two down has the P. So we can go, we can go 5S, 6S, 7S. We can go 5P. Now it's 6P, 7P, et cetera, okay? Then at third energy level, we introduce the D, okay? And then at the fourth, we introduce the F, okay? And so on, so on, that's it, okay? Right there. All right. So each level has an X amount of sub-levels, so... First, the first energy level only has one sublevel. Second energy level has two sublevels or orbits. Third has three, and the fourth has four orbits. Okay. Right. Now, this is a, a two dimensional model, what I just explained. Okay. So we have the nucleus sitting here in the middle, and then we have the first energy level, the first energy level here, but only has the S orbits, okay? Only the S orbit. When we bring in the second energy level, we pick up the, we still have an S, but we introduce the P, okay? So in other words, one, the one energy level would not have a P. And the two energy level would not have a D like the three energy level has. Okay. And then the fourth energy level has uh, the, all of the S, P, D, and F. All right. So what these orbits are, are mathematical models. Now, anytime you make a, 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 a uh, equation, you can plot, you can put data and put it in there and plot the data. And most of the time we see three-dimensional plotting, right? You can plot your data and you can have, you know, individual dots and give you, you know, a straight line or curved line, whatever the case may be, but this is three-dimensional. The result of that is you get a, a plot like what you see in the back of my screen, okay? When you plot that equation for the S orbits, you get this round shape, circular shape, okay? We have more on that. Now, the other thing about all these orbits, the S, uh, the P, the D, and the F, is that each orbit, each sub-level can only handle a maximum of two electrons, okay? Let me repeat that. Every S can handle two. Every P can handle two only. 
D can only handle two electrons and F can handle handle two electrons. However, we're going to learn for the S, there's only one S. For the P, there's three P's type of orbits. For the D's, there are five. For the S, there's seven S. Each one can handle two electrons in this data. Okay? So if there are three P's, each one can handle two electrons, guess what? All the P's can handle a total of six electrons. Okay, all the S's, all the S's can handle six electrons maximum. The P's of which there's are three of those P's, there's three P's, okay? There's only one S orbit, one S orbit, and that each, each S orbit can only handle two, there's only a maximum of two electrons. And the P, there are three P orbits. Each one can handle two electrons. So it gives you a maximum of six electrons for all the Ps. The Ds, there are five, five of them, okay? Notice the picture behind me if you can. You got the red one behind me, that's the S. The next one is three, there's three Ps. The blue ones are the Ds. There's five of them. I don't know if you can see, there's five of them. And the green ones in the bottom, there's seven orbits. Funny looking orbits, but nevertheless, each one can handle two electrons, okay? And then the F, there's seven of them. Those are the green ones behind me. I have a, I'll show you that here in a second, the full picture. Each one can handle a total of 14 for the S, okay? Okay, so each sublevel contains a specific number of orbit. Uh, where are you going? One second, this is acting up on me here. Come on. All right. Now this this kind of if you would take uh, this picture and if you were like turning 180 where you've got the first level in the bottom and basically what you have is an upside down pyramid. I'm gonna have to redraw this. This is a more, a better description, but let's go with what we got here. You got the first energy level, okay? Which of which there are only one S orbit. Okay, so here's the first energy level, which keep in mind the periodic table, that is simply the first period. And in, if you look at the elements, the only ones in the first period are hydrogen and helium, right? Now this box represents the S orbit. And like I stated, each box can handle a total of two electrons. So I'm just gonna put two electrons, make them two dots, okay? In fact, let me, let me, let me do it correctly, I should say. Each electron is, is shown by an arrow, and I put them in different directions because the mathematics involved, which again, to be honest, couple 130 tells us that when the electrons, there's two electrons within the orbit, that they don't, rotate in the same direction. They are rotating in the opposite direction. And hence, I got the arrows there that represent electrons for the S orbit going in different directions, okay? So we get into, so at the maximum number of electrons I can put for the first energy level is two electrons, that's it. All right, here comes the second energy level. Again, second period of my periodic table, starting with the element on the far left and moving all the way across, okay? Keep the two correlated here with me. I'm gonna use that quite a bit. So we have the S orbit, which gets filled first because it's a little bit lower in energy than the P. So I can put two electrons in there, like I did in the first energy level, okay? And so, Let me do it this way. 
if I start off with the um, hydrogen, hydrogen, hydrogen has one electron, okay? It represents hydrogen, one electron, first energy level, S orbit. I go across the periodic table, I got helium. Helium is number two, two electrons, energy, energy level number one, four, okay? If I pick up one electron, follow the periodic table, okay, I have uh, lithium at the periodic table. I fill that up first, and then I keep going across beryllium. I fill the second element, four electrons, okay? Then I shoot across the boron. I fill up the P electrons now. And I keep going across the periodic table. As I go across the periodic table, I can't fill these boxes together. I got to fill them up separately first. Okay. Again, because of the rules of the mathematics involved. And then as I keep going across the periodic table, the first, okay, look at element. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, element number seven. Okay. Then I keep going. With the other electrons, so that I start filling the other box up and go all the way across the periodic table until I get them all full. Okay. And I got which element would this represent? Who can tell me which element would all these arrows represent? I got a total, how many arrows? Two, four, six, eight, 10. Who's element number 10? Come on, somebody knows. Element number 10. Neon, exactly, very good. Element number 10 is neon. Now, notice that element number 10 is in the last column, which is Roman numeral number eight. If you look in the top, it's where the noble gases are. It has eight valence electrons. That means there's eight valence, the outermost shell. Neon has two energy levels. The first energy level is full. The second energy level is full with eight electrons. They have that magical eight that it's looking for, that all elements look for to maintain eight. That's why it's very unreactive. If neon were to gain an electron, the only place it can put it would be in the next energy level. And that would be very energetically unfavored, okay? Because it's gonna go to another energy level. And if you take off, an electron, again, it will be very energetically unfavorable because the eight are full. And it's going to be tough to get rid of one of these electrons in the second energy level. Okay? Now, we go around the periodic table. Who's after neon? What element is number 11? Who knows? Come on, look at, there you go, sodium, exactly. And so sodium, guess what? Look at the end, count the period sodium is in. It's one, two, three. It's in the second, uh, third period, okay? All right, now, the max, let me back up a little bit. The maximum number of electrons that the first energy level can, can you have is two. The maximum number of electrons, what is the maximum number of electrons with the second energy level? Count the arrows here. Two, four, six, eight. I can put an eight in max electrons in the second energy level. And that's it. Now, if I go up to the next energy level, number three, that, that represents sodium. Okay. Now look at what group. Who can tell me from the periodic table what group is sodium in? Oh, you got you to tell me, what group is it in? All right, come on, somebody tell me. Group one, or Roman numeral one, it's in the first group. That tells you that there is one 
electron in the valence shell. I mean, there's one, yeah, there's one. It's in the third energy level. Not only that, sodium to be stable, more, to be in a more stable position is more likely you want to give up that one electron than to pick up more electrons to fill up all these empty boxes. It's just not enough. There's not energy, from an energy perspective, not favorable. Sodium is more likely to get rid of that electron because once it gets rid of this one sole electron, the next shell now is the valence shell. And guess what? It's happy. I got eight now. I'm good to go. Okay. Next one, go across the periodic table. We have that one. That's full. Okay. Now, if we continue all the way across to the third period, and we're going to talk about the D because uh, the D can be a little bit confusing at times, but I'm going to continue. I'll stop here. Okay, let's fill all of these up. Now, for the third energy level, what is the maximum number of electrons that can put in the third energy level? Maximum number of electrons for the third energy level. Count all the arrows there in the third energy level. I can put 10 here, right? Six here and two here. What does that tally up to be? Exactly, 18. And so for the third energy level, the maximum number of electrons that can put in that level is 18. For the second energy level, the maximum number of electrons you can put there is eight. And the first energy level I can put is two. That is a different question than saying the maximum number of electrons for the P orbit. That is for any P orbit, the max I can put is six. For any D orbit, the max I can put in is 10, okay? So when you hear a question, read a question, Body electrons, make sure you understand that they're either asking for the orbit specifically or the energy level, okay? All right, well, I went over the time. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, what I'm gonna do is we'll stop it here. Five, and this is... Uh, slide, that's 20. Okay, we'll come back to this. And you can see what how we did for the fourth energy level, where you can calculate what is the maximum number of electrons we can put in the fourth energy level. All right, well, let me stop it here.